richer in the sense that it's encouraging the students to go on. So an IRF in the first case is very limiting for students' participation. In the second case, think about that. Develop the idea and look at the students' response uh, that they placed in the banks of the river because they were uh, the only fertile ones. This was the first universal classroom interaction about ancient civilizations. It's quite, quite a nice response, I would say. So, if a teacher uses questions for reasons, question, metacognitive questions is uh, a type of question that Dalton Buffer describes as, uh, classifies, uh, and it's when the students are asked to think about why they think in a certain way, okay? So why do you think that way? So it's asking them to reflect on their own opinion, okay? Or, when the teachers provide what I called in a study that I did some years ago, interactional feedback. So I'm going to go back because otherwise I won't be able to read. What's, what's the matter with the soul? That we're talking about some tools. Because the battery is finished, one student said. Oh, you need to get new batteries. And a student, this, uh, the student said, I can't take this one. So the feedback was a kind of interactional feedback in the sense that it was not correcting the student's language. It was not saying good, bad and so on, but it was like showing interest in this tool that this student was showing, okay? These are just examples. I'm sure that you have many more examples from your everyday activity when you teach. But just to call your attention on those. Also, to distinguish questions that are called display, because the, the, the display questions are those questions for which the teacher already knows the answer. I'm not going to read the whole extract because there's no time, but if you just look at the students' responses, animals, yes, plants. I'm not saying that this is wrong, but to, you know, sort of also um, use other types of interactional situations. With referential questions, these are questions for which the speaker does not have the answer. These are the, the real questions that we ask in everyday life. No? We don't go to people and ask questions we know the answer for. No? I don't go to you and ask you, are you a woman? And sometimes we ask these questions to our students and they're like, are you a boy? Well, it's obvious I'm a boy. <laughs> are you a girl, etc. Okay. Um, so the, the response here is much longer. I have two friends, they're brothers, and they, have, they are the same strong. Okay, I'm going to run a bit quicker. Because as you will have a PowerPoint, if you don't have any questions, I'm really open to have a discussion about them with you, or even through Skype or whatever you, you think uh, is more interesting for you. Um, and then, as I said before, the functional questions. Why? Eh? So, do you think the European Union is positive? Yes. Why? And look at the long response. Because the European Union is very good for everything, for example, now we're traveling, we have to do less things and buy products because it is much better and the money you have the same coin and it's very easy. Okay, so it's, the student is interested in <coughs> participating and responding to this question. Now, I talked about the role of the teacher, feedback, types of questions, and also activities. Activities are key in order to elicit different types of interaction. I don't know if you're familiar with show and tell activities where, I'm sure you are, where children come to class with something that they like and they talk about it and there are questions about it. And um, this is just an example from very young children. They were in first year of primary. Um, this Saturday I was in Madrid, I go, I was to Madrid, on Saturday I went to the Thyssen. Oh good, and I saw the portrait of Henry VIII. That famous one? Yes. Yes, and it's like that. You couldn't come up with the right word, it's like that, okay? Yes, A, we expect portraits, don't we, to always be very big? Yes. Showing your, I mean, asking the students to bring their own things to introduce a topic, and this, is, this uh, leads me back to this point of what for, what is the objective, and maybe if we are talking about tools and machines, ask them to bring some tools to class and elicit this everyday language in, in this interaction.
Remember this idea also because I'm not looking at, at language accuracy, but as we saw before, when the students are given the opportunity of producing extended talk, they self-correct themselves. There are more opportunities for them to self-correct and for the other, other students to correct their mate's language. Okay, we saw this example before, I find, I found, okay, where she realizes that she made the error. And Mary Swain, she's very famous in second language acquisition research, she developed the output hypothesis and said precisely that, that students need to be given the opportunity of producing extended talk in order to be able to be aware of uh, language um, errors. I'm going to finish quickly. Another activity which is interesting is group work. We've seen it before, so I'm not going to stop there. But I'm going to show you another activity. I'm going to skip this. The problem of using the other one. That is project work. And I'm, I'm going to play this for you. And I want you to think about what is going on there in terms of language. These students have presented a project, this group, on um, a skateboarding park in a, a dormitory town in Madrid, in the outskirts of Madrid, for Lava, I don't know if you've heard of it. Okay, and they, they had to plan different projects, okay, in the town. And this group decided to uh, present a project to the town hall of a new skateboarding park, okay? And this is, they presented it, and now there is a discussion about the pros and the cons of having a uh, skateboarding park. And I want you to listen to these girls' argumentation. approaches and for language use and development. 
On the other hand, dialogic interactive communication gives the students the opportunity of expressing their views on a topic. Of course, they need linguistic resources, they need the language to be able to, to talk about academic content and to talk about personal experiences. And interaction resources to control turns, to be able to say, oh, it's my turn, okay, wait a minute, and so on. And these resources in clean have to be acquired in the classroom because unfortunately, I mean, well, unfortunately, the only context in which these students are using the foreign language is the classroom. Outside the classroom, they, they communicate in another language, either Spanish or Euskera in this case, in Madrid, for example, which is the context where I live in, in Spanish. Look at IRS can be limiting, but it depends on the questions and the type of feedback and the role of creating different activities. This is very, very important. Because creating different activities are going to, is, different activities are going to uh, trigger a wider variety of resources in the L2, as we saw, rhetorical questions, these kind of things, and different ways of learning the content. So we're talking about content and language, looking at the two together, and these kind of activities trigger a better better context for the learning the two of them. And thank you very much, Mr. Castro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for your wonderful and engaging presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. So I'm sure while you go back home, you can always uh, email her any queries you have, any questions, so she'll be, I suppose, kind enough to answer you. Okay? So thank you once again very much. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the morning session and, of course, uh, your lunch. And now comes the difficult part, uh, which is to stay awake you know, in the afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, then. It's now my pleasure to introduce the first of our Keystone speakers this afternoon, Anna Ginares, who's going to talk about the roles of interaction in the field classroom. Anna Dinares is an associate professor in the English department at the University of Madrid. She teaches second language acquisition, pragmatics and CLIL, both at graduate and postgraduate levels. She coordinates the English strand of the Master of Compulsory Secondary Education at the University. She has done extensive research on classroom discourse analysis in foreign language and bilingual contexts and has published extensively on field learners in the field of spoken written production. She has recently coordinated a number of regional and national projects on CLIL at primary and secondary school levels and has participated in several European Communities projects on bilingual education on CLIL. One of her most relevant publications is The Roles of Language in CLIL, published by Cambridge University Press and co-authored with Tom Morton and Rachel Whitbeck. Professor, the floor is yours. Okay, I think I've done this time. Okay, thanks very much for this very kind uh, introduction and thanks to the organizers for this invitation. 
Special thanks to Loli uh, Iglesias who can't be here today, but she's worked really hard in organizing these and has been very, very active and motivated. Okay, the title of the session today is The Roles of Interaction in CLIL, and I want to call your attention on the fact that I'm going to be referring to the roles and not just the role, because uh, well, uh, many years of research and observation of classes in bilingual uh, schools, both at the primary and the secondary level, have given us some ideas of how interaction is very, very important in any classroom, okay, but more, even more in bilingual classrooms, and how interaction has different roles and not just one role. So I'm going to try to explain to you or to you know, share with you these different roles of interaction and maybe, if possible, you can apply some of them in the classroom or if you're already applying some of them and we can have a discussion about, about it later. Okay, and then you see at the top of the page different classroom situations. Okay, on the left you have our typical one. I don't know whether you can see that properly because it's a little bit dark. But on the left you see a typical uh, home class situation with a student showing uh, active engagement in what is going on in the, in the classroom. Okay, they've raised a lot of them have their hands raised, they are participating. They're quite keen on what is going on. They seem to be quite keen on what is going on in that session. The picture in the middle, the two girls are presenting a project. Okay, I'm gonna be I'm, I'm gonna show you a little clip from that session with uh, some students presenting a project in a geography class in English, okay, they're secondary school students. And on the right you have some kids sitting at a the table, they're doing some uh, arts and crafts, okay, and they are participating in what is called a group work uh, exchange, okay? Right, so first of all, it's important to clarify what we mean by interaction in CLIL. What is interaction in CLIL? Very easy definition, or well, sort of a homemade definition. The way in which oral discourse, oral communication is organized, so it can be organized by teachers, okay, with their students. In the CLIL, I guess everybody's familiar with the term CLIL, content and language integrated <coughs> classrooms or bilingual classrooms to enhance successful content and language integrated learning. Okay, so we are really focusing on interaction. Interaction is a language uh, aspect, okay, but we want, I mean, we, we really want to, uh, to, to, to make the most of, of, of what, what these kids are learning in, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, an integrated learning of content and language, we need to be careful about the content as well. We need to worry about both, but not in separate ways, but trying to integrate them. Okay, we, in our uh, recent uh, studies on CLIL, we've been very careful of trying to address this idea of integration because in many cases we just look at the language aspect or not so much at the content aspect in terms of research, I mean, in terms, in terms of the studies that are being done on CLIL. But what about integration? We're talking about CLIF, we really need to look at useful pedagogies in terms of integration. Okay, so why focus on interaction in CLIF? Well, according to Constant Leon, and then this is something that we picked up in a book that we recently, recently published uh, with uh, Cambridge University Press, there are many interesting language focus areas in CLIF, but we think there are two that are particularly relevant for these specific classrooms because of course there are many aspects that are equally relevant for any classroom, being it a content classroom, a language classroom, but uh, specific for CLIO. One is the demands and affordances of language learning in the context of curriculum subject learning. So what is learning English, the English of biology in contrast with learning the English of geography, okay, so what are the specific characteristics of a subject that I'm teaching, okay, of a language of the subject that I'm teaching, or of a specific topic within the subject that I'm teaching, or a specific text type or genre within the topic of a subject that I'm teaching, it is important to know these specific features of language, okay, in order to be able to to uh, highlight those aspects of the language that might be more problematic for students' understanding or students' production of whatever 
uh, in whatever content subject, be it history, geography, etc. But this is not the topic I'm going to focus on today. The other area that Leon considers key in bilingual education, English and English and additional language context, clear context, is to focus on the ways languages are actually used in classroom interaction and activities. So what is going on in the classroom? Okay, between the teacher and the students, among the students themselves, in order to be able to identify those moments, those activities, those tasks where something is going on, where the students are more interested in participating, they're using the foreign language uh, more, and they participate in longer terms, so that means that they're using, they're, they're, they're practicing the language, they're hypothesizing about the language, and maybe they're even self-repairing their errors, or their, their classmates are also more aware of their errors because they have the chance of using the language more extensively. Okay? So which are those, those moments? So quoting constantly, on, he says, um, how teachers and students use their languages in teacher and learning activities so that we have a better understanding of what goes on in bilingual education classrooms in different world locations. So what is going on? And what, do I, what, 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 what is it that is really working well? And how can I enhance this and not other uh, classroom situations? Well, just to, just to show you, just to give you an overview, this is, this is a kind of map of, of the book that we wrote where we focused on three main areas. And one of these areas that we considered key, as I said before, is the area of classroom interaction, subject literacy, as I mentioned uh, before as well, but I'm not going to focus on that today and then students' language development, development from the point of view of how they express content, how they interact about content in terms of the interpersonal meanings that they, that they use, and how do they produce written and spoken texts. Okay? But I'm going to focus on classroom interaction. And then you see that assessment goes across. So it's not assessing language separately from content, not assessing content separately from language, but assessing, trying to assess within all these three areas. Difficult area, assessment in, in clinical course. So, um, which features of interaction are relevant to promote learning in clear? We used a, a, a model that was used by, sorry, oh, I went to the very bad.
communicate content. And here, we think it's very, very important to look at learner participation. So, where, in what situations we see that there is more uh, participation from the learners, because as, as you all know, the teachers tend to well, cover quite a lot of, of the time, or most of the classroom time. Okay, okay, so which situations are given a more prominent role to the, to the learner? The different roles of the teacher and the type of the activity. I mean, in my view, the type of activity is key in order to, to try, when you, you try to elicit different types of language and interaction. The activity is going to be very, very important in any subject because you can design similar types of activities in different, in different subjects. Okay, so this is more or less like the diagram that we're going to follow, okay, in order to cover all these roles of interaction. And, and then we can have a discussion at the end if you want about what roles you think are more relevant or not so relevant, or if you feel that there are other roles that are missing here that should be included. The content, we said, what is being talked about? Is the teacher covering the topic of genetic variation, for example, in biology, or factors of development in different countries, in geography, or Romanist churches? Obviously, you need to be aware of the topic. I'm not going to focus on that because this is pretty obvious, but the purpose, what for? So what is being done with that content? What does the teacher want? Does the teacher want to engage students' interest in a new topic? Uh, in order to do that, it might be useful for the teacher to use uh, everyday knowledge that the students might have on a certain topic. Yeah, for example, let's say, I'm not a biology expert at all, but um, because I've been observing so many clay classrooms, uh, you know, like, uh, some topics uh, come up quite often. In, uh, for example, the, the, the topic of bacteria, okay, and then ask the students whether they uh, there, there is something in the, or there are some, um, uh, any, any food that they have or drink that contain bacteria, and then triggering this of the uh, LKSA and all that. This is everyday experience of a student, okay? So if you want to trigger that, that everyday knowledge that the students have, you're going to expect a different type of language. If you want to go over homework, obviously you expect the students to uh, to, to uh, produce or to uh, show the knowledge and the language in order to express that knowledge, uh, which might be more academic than in the first case, okay? Uh, or maybe you want to uh, Ask the students to apply knowledge in a in a new content. Uh, sorry, in a new context. I'm gonna stop first on the purpose then. So we said, what kind of content? What is the purpose? Everyday content or academic? I don't know whether you're familiar with this uh, terminology by comics. It's very very famous. No, the contrast between BIGS, which is basic interpersonal communi communicative skills. In a language, so it's in other words, in very simple terms, everyday language, okay, and the COB, which is the cognitive academic language proficiency, which is academic language. So let's say basic communicative language and academic language. These terms have been used widely and applied to um, uh, second language training and second language teaching and learning, because, for example, in the US, when they tested immigrant children's level of English, well, when they, when they, when, when they uh, saw the results of immigrant children's, uh, um, the results in their tests, uh, when they uh, participated, they were uh, integrated in uh, mainstream classrooms, they saw that although they had previously seen that these children had quite a good level of English, the results in the tests were quite poor. And they found out that it's because, of course, they had a very good level of peaks basic interpersonal communicative skills, but they didn't have a good level of CALP, of academic English, okay? So of course it's important to take that into account if you're testing academic content, no? because content is, cannot be separate from language. In our context, um, it might be the opposite. If 
we think about clearly with foreign languages. Oh, I'm not talking about Euskera, but um, thinking of English, uh, teaching subjects through English. We might find um, a, a possible worry might be that the children finish with a good level of academic English, so they know all the words in English, and uh, even the rivers, uh, the Spanish rivers in English. But what about basic interpersonal communication skills? Will they be able to really communicate fluently? You know, when they finish school and they come across a situation where they have to, to solve a problem, I don't know, whatever, you know, with a problem they have with their bank, or, this is one of the worries. No? So in our case, it might be more of the bigs that we could worry about. In any case, it's an interesting distinction. And of course, when we plan, when we think of a content we're going to teach and the purpose, we need to be aware of whether we are eliciting the beeps and practicing the beeps, or we are eliciting the cup. If we uh, create situations where most of the interaction is focusing on the cup, we're missing an opportunity there. Well, two opportunities in, in one, because in a way, if you use the beeps, you might attract the students more to your side in the sense that they're talking about everyday topics that are they feel they know, okay, before being introduced to bacteria in a more academic way. And at the same time, you're missing the opportunity of language practice, which is more everyday sort of language, you know, and not leaving the academic way aside. So when, you're, when your objective is collecting the students' ideas about a topic, you might get quite a lot of the bigs. When you check what the students have learned a certain concept, you're practicing the comp. Okay. When you apply knowledge to a new situation, well, maybe the two of them. Either situation is an everyday situation that they have to solve. Okay, and then so what kinds of language do students need to participate in that activity? Not the same if the activity is very top academic or not so academic. Or if it's a mixture. <coughs> okay, within the purpose, we're still in the purpose. There, there is a, an interesting distinction uh, by uh, Francis Christie in a book that is called Classroom Discourse Analysis between two classroom registers. She calls one the instructional register, another one the regulative register. And the instructional register, I'll show you an example there is uh, the part of the classroom in which the teacher and the students, mainly the teacher, focuses on the content, um, the, the specific topic of the lesson, okay? And I put in brackets, it could, it could be vertical or horizontal, it could be more, if it's vertical, it's more camp, academic, if it's horizontal, it's more mixed. It's another term. Distinction by Bernstein, which is more or less similar to Jim Cummings' distinction between Bix and Cal. Okay, but it's the register, so it's the, the, the part of a classroom that is dedicated to talking or working on the specific topic or content of a classroom. Okay, this is just an example. Why can't you see the same land without leaving it to uh, rest? Because you plant different things. The student answers, "Good, by planting different things which need different substances from the air." Do you know in Spanish? La tierra está en bar en barbecho, barbecho, good. So they're talking about the topic, and the teacher is specifically interested in the, the vocabulary that they need uh, in this history lesson, okay? Regulative register has to do with managing and organizing the classroom as a social space. Who tends to lead this type of register? Obviously, the teacher. It's the role of the teacher. So from a point of view of a use of, in this case, English by the teacher, by the clear teacher, the, lead, the teacher obviously, in order to organize an activity, needs to use uh, directives. Okay, okay, listen to me. Okay, so because you want to catch the attention of the students, then you need to be able to uh, announce that there is a new topic, that there is a new activity. You want to call the attention from the students that there is a change maybe in the activity. Something different. The purpose of the activity. Now we're going to change things. And using uh, these cross devices to make sure that the students are following. Right, right. 
One, do you follow? Okay, is this clear? And uh, giving examples. Okay, so this is from a point of view of the teachers. What I find really interesting is how can you, how you can, what happens if you get the students to participate in these two classroom registers. Obviously, in the instructional register, this is what is expected from students. And students are expected to participate, uh, showing that they know the content, okay, in a, in a content class. Remember we're talking about content classes taught through English or whatever other language. So look at, look at students' participation in this uh, dialogue in the instructional register, which is discussing the content. Tell me the name of the different parts of the ground plan. The, the topic of this lesson was uh, churches, okay, it was a history lesson. These chapels here, what are the names of that? Apsis. Apsis, that's right. Then the teacher goes on. What's the name of this central part? Name. You're doing very well. Do you remember the name, Anna? Well, the student says, Islas, and then the teacher recasts the pronunciation, says, Isle, that's right, the Isle's here. So the students, in this case, they're participating, they're doing well, I mean, they're doing what the, te the teacher is happy, seems to be happy, okay, she's giving positive evaluation to the student's responses, but in terms of language practice and language use, the students' terms are not really very rich, I mean, they know the vocabulary, but the opportunities of getting them to say more and use a language in this situation are, are somehow missed, or there are not so many okay, opportunities. Look at the students' participation in the regulative register. This is an example from a group work activity. Of course, the problem is how to get them to use the language the foreign language and not their mother tongue in group work activities. That is another issue. But when they do use it, look at what they say. They use the language in a kind of, in, in, a, in a similar way to the way the teacher does when she participates in this register. Because it's, it's very typical for teachers to use this register when they organize an activity. Look at one of the students. Boys, look, I think we do three, but we can do one. They're negotiating. It's not easy to understand what he means, but he's trying very hard to sort of organize how they're going to work on this activity. Student, said, uh, student two says, okay, claro. Student one, because three is very a lot. We make one, but not three or four. Okay, do you like my opinion, my idea? Uh, uh, C, this is the name of the teacher, but I just used the, the initial, gave us a box. Please. Antonio, whoever, speak in English. Okay, so you see a very typical teacher teacher role. Okay, speak in English. But D, look, we only do one, only one. So from a point of view of a use of peaks, there is quite a lot going on there compared to what is going on in the instruction world. Well, first of all, of course, the students speak more. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you manage to get them to do it in English, they use the language for functions, for purposes that they wouldn't use at all in whole class interactions, focusing only on the specific content. Okay? I know. How do we get them to use the language, the target language, when they're working in groups? Okay. But, um, I think teachers need to be aware of affordances, the opportunities that these kind of activities can give, provided that the students have a certain level of, of the language. Uh, so in the instructional register, remember instructional register is when we are dealing with the content, okay? Non-academic language encourages students' participation and negotiation of meaning, the use of peaks. The transition into the academic language needs to be sequential. It is important that both are there. But sometimes we forget about the beeps, or we introduce the CAUP, the, the, the academic, uh, very difficult abstract language, too early. So sequentially, for example, we've done quite a lot of work on, on the history genres, and we looked at 
For example, the difficulties of presenting the students with a text that has a lot of argumentation from the very beginning. I mean, we looked at a, a history textbook that is out in the market, a history uh, textbook, the first unit was prehistory, and there was a text on Agapuerca, which was, I mean, it was really interesting, very rich, but very difficult for this first, first, first year of so as the first text that they had to face, because it was very argumentative. So many, many people have done work on how to sequence, to scaffold the difficulty of academic language and academic texts, okay? Because of all these texts are produced through language. So, for example, in history, to begin with chronological narrations and then move little by little to uh, more abstract sort of uh, histories, such as when, when texts contain explanations and argumentation. So, sequencing, scaffolding within how scaffolding from lower uh, difficulty to higher difficulty, and then try to maintain also communicative situations that encourage everyday language in order to make sure that these students use, use, uh, participate uh, with uh, uh, everyday language and basic communicative skills. In the regulative register we found that there are a lot of like, more language functions being practiced because they use directives. And directives uh, is a Pragmatic function has to do with telling people to do things. Usually it's the teacher that tells the students to do things. So give the student the opportunity of also asking their mates to do things. Okay? Because they're practicing the language for different purposes. We talked about the interest of group work and activities. And of course, this may be a challenge because the students are not used to this type of situations where they have to use English to organize a task. But if it's carefully planned and structured, you're uh, still focusing on your objectives, okay, for whatever content you want to practice, and at the same time you're getting them to use the foreign language to organize it. So it's another, it has some, a different function. Okay, we move on. We stopped on purpose and now we move on to how. So what for, what and what for, what for, and now to how. Interaction, and we follow Mortimer and Scott again on this. We think it's so interesting their distinction between interactive, non interactive, dialogic, and authoritative. Um, Teachers can be interactive and dialogic, and so there is interaction, and there are different ideas that are being talked about, okay, considered. Or they can be interactive, but authoritative. So the teacher is trying to get the student's answers, but there is only one uh, point of view that is taken into account, which is, and I'm quoting a teacher that told us about you know, the, the official scientific view. She said, at some points, you know, I really like interacting with them about their views, their everyday experience, but there is a point in which, you know, there is just one answer. You know? There is just one scientific answer, and there is no discussion about it, okay? So that's the, the sort of uh, interactive authority. For example, remember the example before with the Romanist church? What is this? This is, this is a typical example of a an interactive, because there is interaction, but authoritative, because the teacher is expecting specific answers, okay? So, no other ideas are being discussed or talked about. Which is fine, I mean, this is, typical. This is what is expected from a class, and we're not going to say here that, you know, this has to be changed, but it's just being aware of other possibilities that can be combined. Um, or it can be dialogic, not, if it's not interactive, it can be dialogic because the teacher can be just presenting herself without interacting with the students different points of view, for example, from different scientists. Or it can be non-interactive authoritative, just to present, to lecture, really, one topic. Right, this is just to give you the overall idea. I'm going to show you 
two examples, just because what, it, what is interesting for us, and for me in particular, is to see what kind of communicative situations uh, encourage students' participation and in what ways, okay? So how much of, of, uh, we get of students' participation in each of these two uh, types. And I've chosen the two extreme types. No, no, interactive authoritative, it's the teacher talking and the students just nodding, okay, which is the one on the left. Listen, listen, this is the way it is, okay? So it's very it's clear, this is the way it is. Uh, I'll write something on the board for you, okay? Um, have you studied at all? Yes? Okay, this is asking about, <coughs> would be part of a regulatory register. Okay, listen, you all know this, you know this, don't you? Okay, now, okay, a compound A, that's going to turn into a compound B, okay? Chemical reaction, enzymes are proteins and they're not, yes? There must be one gene, uh, gene one, that goes for, his enzyme, for this enzyme one. Do you agree? Yes, yes. Now, okay? Okay, and then she goes on and ends with, well, that's the way it is, in the same way as she started. Okay, marking that this is a scientific story and you have to learn it and accept it as it is. Which is fine, it's necessary. But look at what happens in the other extract. What do you think a mutant is? Okay, the, the, the way she's asking about a mutant, in a way it's like making the students think that what they think is important. Okay? Have you ever seen a mutant? This is generating bigs. Yes, I saw a mutant the other day at my friend's place, whatever. In films, in films, can you give me an example of a mutant? What is a mutant? In plants, in plants. Do you have any mutant plants at home? Uh -huh. A doberman. So it's generating more everyday vocabulary. Okay? That is not being generated in the other, in the other extract. But actually it doesn't. It happens in nature. The Doberman, the Doberman. Is that a mutant? A Doberman? It looks weird, yes, but it's not a mutant. And then the student says, it's a mixture. The student is not really responding to the teacher. It's like, eh, I want to say it's a mixture, it's not a mutant. Okay, so there is more involvement here going on from a student. And another example I wanted to show you, because I find it extremely rich in terms of language learning, this comes from our fourth year of primary classroom on materials. And the teacher is checking the homework. Okay? So the purpose of, a class, of this specific session was checking whether the students had done the homework and what kind of answers they had, they had uh, provided to the questions. And one student the teacher says, well, okay, let's check the answers of the exercise on page five. One student says, Pilar, on page five. Pilar, can I, what material? So, Pilar, can I, she's trying, she's calling the attention of the teacher. Yes, on Sunday I go to a, I went to, the teacher corrects, he passes. I go to a, I went, I went to a, how do you say exposition? And the teacher says, exposition, exhibition. So, um, and the student says, exhibition, and I find, and I found, a person that is making with two, with two, with two dosh powers. So you see how rich, the, I mean, being given the opportunity of talking about her own experience, about an exhibition that is totally related to the topic of a classroom, the student is hypothesizing about even her own language errors because she says, I find, and then she realizes herself and she says, I found. I'm using the wrong terms. Okay, and then she, she uses Spanish when she can't come up with a word in a very, very creative way. And the turns are really long. Huh? Remember, this is a fourth year of primary student. She was making what? She was making, or he was making, that person was making. She was making the glass with a protect glass. It's made glass with a fire and so two sticks, so water and melt, okay, with heat and that. She makes a special watch to make the neck. So she's using supporting, supporting glosses to make the neck. So the, the turns are really quite complex for, for what you can find in this student's participation. If they were just answering about the right materials used for whatever tools, okay, which was the topic of the lesson. 
And where, where was that? Here in Tres Cantos, in Madrid, in Madrid. Oh, maybe we can talk to whoever and go and see it because that experience is, experience is interesting. So the, I thought this is a very, very nice example of an interactive dialogic type of extract, okay, classroom situation, where the students' ideas and experiences are taken into account. And of course, the terms that, that this, the terms of the, the participation of these students is much richer, and she uses longer terms than in, in other situations. So, with dialogic teaching, students participate in interaction with longer terms and more complex language, instead of just responding with very short answers, basically focusing on key vocabulary. They learn communication strategies as well. And this idea that, I don't know if you're familiar with Go Coils. Go uh, Coil, do you know Go Coil? Okay. This idea of cognitive engagement uh, and, and the use of the fact that clean learners do not only learn English better, but they learn many other things. So this addition, additional aspect of, of, of CLIP, for example, communication strategies, and I would intervene and you're doing it in English, okay? They learn different perspectives on a topic because if, you, if different voices are being taken into account, there is space for agreement and disagreement. So you don't only learn the language as a student of agreement and disagreement, but you also learn the topic in a different way, moving away from only facts, and this is something that a colleague from Austria, Christiane Dalton Buffer, I don't know if you're familiar with her, she's very famous in research in CLIL. She says in her study of CLIL in, uh, in Austrian classrooms, she found that most of the, most of the lessons uh, focus mainly on facts. So the language that you get from the students is, uh, is basically focusing on facts, so there is little space for other interpersonal approaches to the content and uh, interpersonal uh, sort of uh, language uh, use. And there is linguistic redundancy because different ideas are discussed, but the same ideas are also presented in different, different ways. In different ways, so they learn the content better because they have the same idea covered in different perspectives, but also they're practicing the language in different ways. Okay, so this is um, this has to do with negotiation of meaning, communication, text communication, dialogic, interactive, authoritative, non interactive. Now we move down to the lower level, a more specific level, which is looking at actual interaction patterns. Okay, this is just presenting what I'm going to talk about. Um, I guess you have access to this PowerPoint, is that right? So you can, you can have them, you can see what different slides are going back to. So the IRF pattern, are you familiar with this term, IRF? Typical interaction pattern in a classroom. The teacher initiates, that's why it's called I. The student responds, R. And the teacher provides feedback, F. Yeah, that's why, why it's called an IRF pattern, an IRF exchange. It's an exchange which consists of three terms, teacher, student, teacher. And this is very typical. The role of a student tends to be that of responding to the teacher's question. Do you agree? Usually that, that's the case. Okay. Now this pattern has been criticized a lot. I don't really agree with all the criticism, but only partly. Well, some people like uh, uh, Leo Van Leer says that it doesn't really encourage students to initiate terms and do other repair, which is partly too, uh, true, but you can have an IRF pattern initiated by the student. How do you get students to initiate an IRF? You have to create an activity that encourages them to initiate. It doesn't offer enough space for students to participate with longer terms and express their own ideas. This is partly true because in general, the R part of the three parts tends to be short responses, but not always, okay? It can be very limiting if it's really, uh, if, the, if the initiation uh, expects the students to respond with a very, very simple vocabulary answer like this. 
this. No, where is water used? In houses. In the houses. Okay, there are even shorter responses <laughs> with just one single word. And it's a little bit funny that blue. Okay, I'll read it for you. Thank you. Okay. However, IRF is neither good nor bad per se. It depends on the activity, as I will show you in a minute, types of questions, and roles of the participants. Because it might be the students that initiate okay, the exchange. I'm, I'm referring to this pattern because it's a very typical traditional pattern that is taken into account in classroom, in classroom interaction. No? That is used as an example. For example, an IRF pattern. The teacher says, okay, now, let's see, milk. Does milk come from plants or animals? Animals. And then the teacher says, from animals, that's right. From the cow or the goat. So cut up the pictures, blah, 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 blah. Okay, typical IRF. The student's response is animals. That's all. The rest of the talk is being done by the teacher. Well, and then yes. Okay, sorry. Animals, yes. What happens in this one? Where did first, these are all examples taken from real data. Sorry, I forgot to, 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 to tell you at the beginning. Okay, from a corpus that we have, primary and secondary uh, field data. Where did first civilizations appear? That um, Egypt, along the Nile. Okay, yes, along the Nile. Why along rivers? Think about that. Develop that idea. This is an IRF. But if you see the type of feedback given by the teacher is much 